Afternoon, everybody. Very warm welcome. Stuffy welcome, more like. Uh, yep, it has come round again. Another staying connected virtual lunch from the guys at Amros Promotions. Hope you're all well. Um, thank you very much for joining us for an hour out of your Friday afternoon. Uh, of course, we're here every other week. Come rain, shine, thunder, lightning, or ice cream vans, as I've got outside my house right now. Um, Looking around, I'm delighted to see some lockdown tans on display today. I'm very impressed with them, especially when you've been at your desk all week. Uh, today, we're bringing you two speakers whilst we just sit in good company and enjoy some great insights into the worlds of finance and sport. Now, um, there are three ways to get the best out of today's virtual lunch. Number one, we ask that you keep your mic muted. So we don't hear the ice cream vans coming past your house. Uh, also, the best way to enjoy it is set your uh, Zoom up with speaker view. Um, and third, and most importantly, if you have a badminton racket handy, please hang it somewhere in the background so Gail can see it. Uh, of course, these virtual lunches at the minute are still the nearest we can get to our usual lunches, whilst uh, <laughs> mass gatherings are still banned at the minute, our next lunch will of course be after the new rulings come in on July the 4th. So uh, to adapt, you can invite your hairdresser to come and watch the next one. Or if you want, just go to Bournemouth Beach and watch along, should be fine. Uh, a very big thank you to Kevin Provert Wealth Management who have sponsored to lunch, uh, today's lunch. Kevin will be our first speaker to chat shortly. If you have a question for him or a question for our other guest, Gail Ems, then you can pop them in the chat. Just remember to let us know who you are and what company you're from when you send us your question. Um, everybody who asks one, whether it's about finance or badminton or hairdressing, uh, will be entered into a draw to win a bottle of wine from the brilliant guys at Bottles of Worcester. And congratulations to our winner from our last lunch, who was Andrew the Borwell Fox, who asked Mike Tyndall, uh, who from the royal family he would love to go on a secret all day with. Uh, his answers are Eugenie or the Queen. Good answers. Great question. Thank you, Andrew. So you can pop your questions in the chat at any point this afternoon and we'll keep an eye on those for you. Um, so our first speaker this afternoon will be Mr. Kevin Probert. He's up first. Kevin, I just need to check you can hear us and you're nearly ready to go. Yep, all fine. Just checking. Good. Nice bit of satellite delay there. Gives me heart palpitations. Uh, your course is someone who regularly joins us on our, our physical lunches. How's yep. the uh, switch to virtual been for you? Um, yeah, very much a new experience. Uh, technology is not really a strong point for the aging people like ourselves, but uh, now we've embraced it. It's been quite good. Um, and it's, uh, I think we've learned a lot from the youngsters and um, it's, shown us, uh, it's shown us one of the ways forward, to be quite honest. That's nice to be classed as a youngster. Thank you. Um, and our other guest this afternoon is none other than Olympic and Commonwealth Badminton star, TV and radio pundit, and a keen Twitter quizzer, <laughs> Gail Ems. Gail, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, thank you for having me today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hot though. I'm a little bit hot and sweaty, but apart from that, it's all good. Good. And um, when we spoke to Mike Tindall last week, he told us that he has a Zoom wallpaper background, which simply is a wallpaper of a bookshelf. Can you just can you just confirm that the drum kit is real? The in your drum background? kit is real. If you want me to go and play, I can play for you later. But um, when I say play, it will be uh, my my. I, I have no drumming skills whatsoever, so it will just be whacking them in random order. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll see if, if, if Kevin finishes a bit early, then <laughs> stand by, get your sticks handy, all right? All right I'll, I'll uh, thank you very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll start off, though, if we can, with, with you, please, Kevin, um, just to, I suppose, get an idea of, of, of the landscape of how things have been for you um, recently. What, what conversations have you been having with your clients and what sort of things are they, are they concerned about? Yeah, um, being in the finance world, very different to the... Uh, the readjustment we had in 2008, if anybody can remember that far back. Um, this has been much more about the health and welfare of my clients, really. Um, and of course, dealing with a lot of limited companies, their employees. So it's not going to be so much, it's not going to not have been so much about the security of money and stuff like that. It's been more about how they're, how they're looking after themselves, really, which is quite strange. 
Um, we've had a lot of, obviously, um, people asking about valuations on their pensions and investments, and we do look after them. They, they've all got access to the wealth accounts, so they can look at it themselves, but it's, it still doesn't get rid of the, um, uh, you know, me picking the phone up or me going on a Zoom or me going on Teams and having a chat to them. They like that quite well. Um, but what they're, they're more concerned, they're, well, they're more happy about is that we didn't get so much of a drop as we had in the past. And so therefore being, you know, they're, they're quite experienced, most of the clients are, so they know about the ups and downs in the, in the market. And to have recovered so quickly, I think it's given them quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of personal pride, really, that they're, they're quite happy with the way we've done everything. Um, and of course, if you now look at the cash savings side of things, I don't know whether anybody looked at uh, um, the money, money program yesterday. Um, and you know, we're getting now long-term five-year fixed interest rates at 1.16% for savers. Um, you know, you've only got to go back 15 years when I know my dad used to get between eight and 11% for his money. Um, and that used to pay for all his holidays. It doesn't happen anymore now. So investment's got to be the key you've just got to be a little bit clever and a little bit uh, savvy about it. And, and as far as that, you know, that whole term, which gets, you know, which has been thrown around a bit, stock market crashes, how, how concerned should people be? And if not, why not? Um, yes, we've, we, we haven't had so much of a stock market crash. Um, what we've had is we've had um, everybody looking at the FTSE because everybody looks at the FTSE 100 and thinks that's where everything is and it's not. Um, so when the FTSE dropped around, you know, sort of 30% at the beginning of March towards the end of March, um, we found the typical drops in our portfolios were around 12% and the clients were quite, um, quite shocked at that. They didn't realize that we'd, um, we've got so much diversification in the physical portfolios that they're in, that we've only got probably 30 to 60% in equities. And so therefore we don't have that massive drop like you do in the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's been quite interesting, but also on the flip of that, um, they're quite, they've been quite amazed at how quickly the, um, the portfolios have recovered where it still doesn't look as if the FTSE has, but it has, it's done quite well. It has done quite well. Yeah. Um, um, go on, so I am back with you, aren't I? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, it's good. Um, if I give you an example on um, yeah. one, of the, one of the biggest, it's always best to do examples. Um, I've got, a, I do a lot of drawdown um, in pensions. And um, if I just, I've just chosen a random client that's been in drawdown since the age of 60, he's now 69. So he sort of kicked into drawdown, going into retirement just after the crash of uh, 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and at that time, we invested around 550 grand for him. Um, he's had total withdrawals to date of just over 284,000 pounds, which is eight years at 24 grand and the last two years at 36,000. And the current value of his scheme is 442,000. So he's done really, really well um, and we haven't really done that much with him. He's in a low to medium risk area, um, but we've had no challenges. It's been quite good. The COVID-19 challenge is really the first time we've ever seen the drops. So he's quite happy. Um, yeah, and it's, it's pretty good, pretty good. Um, the, the adverse changes in sort of investments and pensions, does that mean people need to adjust mm -hmm. like long term with financial aims? Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things we do at, Cape, at Kevin Prober Wealth Management is we do a lot of, um, of cash flow forecasting. Um, so we do that before we start and we do that as a, as a regular thing every six to 12 months with the clients. And what we build in there is a 20% loss right from beginning on. And so therefore, um, in most cases, no, the clients don't have to adjust. Um, obviously, uh, we check on the money they've got. Uh, what they need are they are they taking too much out whatever we do that all the time but no we we, we create these detailed cash flow forecasts and uh, they normally work out quite well about um life cover and life insurance is that going to change after after covid19 is it, is it going to be more expensive yeah that could well be one of the it could well be the case and um, one of the good things that have come out of covid19 is 
Um, we've done an awful lot of um, live cover and critical illness over the last 14, 15 weeks. Um, a lot to do with uh, business owners, making sure that they're all okay. Um, and yes, we've, we've noticed that um, it has become a little bit more expensive. However, um, COVID-19 is still totally covered. So we haven't had any problems with that. Um, and more to the, more to the point, um, the problem with COVID-19 is, of course, is that it's, it's affected much more of the older generation than the younger generation. And most of them, they probably haven't got the life cover anyway. So, to, you know, it's, it's not really, um, it's not really the, the life cover side of things hasn't really been exposed to the COVID-19. And so therefore, we haven't had so much, uh, so much of an increase. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I was going to say the pricing and that sort of thing um, is pretty much good. The biggest problem we had was that uh, we couldn't um, write the sum assured that some people wanted. So what we did was we went to the underwriters for Aviva, Legal and General, Royal, Royal London, all the top companies, and we basically got an idea as to what they would look at without any medicals, because it was very difficult to send a client for a medical, because um, obviously uh, everybody was um, was putting the effort into uh, reducing COVID-19 and you know, that sort of thing just fell by the wayside. Um, and that's been quite good because we've done all that. And now, of course, we can now with, um, with the, the drop in numbers of deaths, et cetera, which is absolutely fantastic. What we can now do is we can now go out and see those clients again, rejig the life cover, go back out, send them for the medicals and get the right summer, summer shores in place for them going forward. So, yeah, it's been okay. It's been all right. What about um, the effects of all the, you know, the furlough schemes and, and the... Um uh, income support schemes uh, that the government have laid on. Um, how's that going to affect financial planning going forward? Yeah, I think that's, um, I, I, I couldn't really believe how much um, the, the Chancellor put into place over such a short period of time, bearing in mind he'd, he'd been in that position for less than a month. Um, and we've all got to remember that. So he's done, he's done quite a, he's got a really, really good job. However, what's going to happen? Obviously, it's added significantly to the, the national debt. And so therefore, we, we know it's going to happen. There's going to be changes to personal tax rates and bans, changes to tax relief on pensions, changes to capital gains taxes, VAT, entrepreneurs relief, business property relief, increase of insurance premium tax. All of these taxes, I am sure, will see some kind of increase. Um, the good thing about it is, I suppose, is that by the time this is uh, not over, but it's under control, um, the government will only have two to three years to go before they want re-election. And so therefore that could play a little bit to our side and maybe they won't, um, they won't do anything that's really stupid. They really won't. They'll, they'll do it nice. Yeah, nice and simple. Do you think there are going to be other, any other changes in financial services as a result of the pandemic? Definitely for us. Um, we're looking at, uh, so we, we pride ourselves on communication with our clients and I see my, most of my clients two to three times a year, maybe even more often than that. And what Zoom and Teams have brought into that is that sort of allowed us um, to communicate with our clients much more freely. Um, and, you know, I don't have to drive there. My fuel savings going to be fantastic. The environment's going to be much better off for that. Um, you know, 35,000 mile a year um, is ridiculous really these days. Um, and I won't have to do that. And in fact, I've also, I've done a couple of, um, a big, um, big pension transfers um, since COVID-19, and I haven't even met the client. I've just done them through Zoom, through Teams. Um, I feel a little bit funny about it because I always feel that um, using Zoom and Teams is great to build up the relationship, get everything done. But when you physically ask for that signature at the bottom of the, uh, the page, it's much better to be in front of the client and make sure that he fully understands what he's entering into really. But otherwise, no, it's been good. Yeah, it's been good. Well, and I was just going to think on the flip side, there's obviously everything that financial services are doing, but is there anything particular that businesses are telling you that they found particularly tricky in the ways they're suffering? Yeah, I think the, um, the um, getting the setting up the premises, getting it right for social distancing, and getting it right with all the, all the legislation that's coming through with the government, that's caused a few problems, but they've all embraced that and gone on with it. Um, the problem they're having is that they can do everything they want to do themselves for their own business, but nine times out of 10, they're relying on other companies um, who they use. And of course, if those companies aren't doing it at the same speed or whatever, then it slows everything down again. But
but um, you know we're a pretty resilient guy, really resilient lot, the British, and um, I'm pretty sure that we will be uh, back on course very, very quickly. But I'm forever the optimist anyway, so uh, let's just go and get it done. Yeah, good. Oh, I lost you there, mate. That's better, isn't it? There you go. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about markets. The you know, it's had a, it's had an effect on the markets, obviously. But does that mean it's a time to, for people to look at share trading accounts, individual shares? Yeah, I mean, I've got a, I've done just done a couple of examples here. And um, so, as soon as the pandemic hits, everybody freezes. Oh my God, my money, my pension. What am I going to do? Um, I've, I've, just, I've just chosen one out of many pension transfers and pension investments that we've done and investments that we've done over the last 14 weeks. But this particular lady, on the 20th of March, she invested £91,200 uh, into her pension scheme. She took a tax-free cash of twenty-two grand, left a value of £68,000, and the current value today is £84,616. That's an increase of 16 grand or 23.75% in three months. It's ridiculous and it's done really well. And then I've got another one, another guy who um, contacted us before the pandemic and um, he wanted to put some money away into his pension scheme. And we, we always gear up in February, ready for that in March. And in very simple terms, um, his total, his pay was around 120 grand. Um, he wanted to do a 70 grand gross investment into his pension scheme, which costs him 56,000 pounds. And by the time we fitted everything together, um, he'd actually invested 70,000 pounds. His money's gone up by 19.6% at 83 grand, 720 pounds. And the total cost to him taking off all the tax relief was 38,000 pounds. So these people have, have really done quite well out of something that's not so good. Um, and we just need to maintain that now. And what about, uh, there was always, there was a lot of buzz in the, in the, the months before and probably a year or a few before uh, everything hit about Bitcoin. Uh, where's, where's that now? Well, how does that, how does that look as, as an yeah. investment? Never been really involved in Bitcoin. Um, however, I think it has got a place in, in the marketplace because, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's volatile, it's up and down, up and down all the time. But I've got quite a few clients that have bought it and they bought Bitcoin and, and you can sort of, you know, you can, so long as you can lose the money that you invest into Bitcoin, I think it's a very good thing. It's a little bit like single shares. Um, you know, I'm not a great um, stock picker. I'm not, I'm more of a risk manager. And so I decided uh, to do some single shares all the way through um, lockdown and I'm 850 pounds down on my investment. Um, and that's got nothing to do with what I've chosen that's been bad. It, they, they've not been bad. Carnival, the, um, the cruise line, cruise liners into owns all the shops, you know, that sort of thing. They were quite really good prices in March. And of course they've dropped um, and we don't know what's gonna happen to into at the moment. Um, but I've also gone the other way and I've invested in Barclays. I've invested, invested in, um, in Lloyd's. I've invested in St. James's Place. And they've done reasonably well, um, but they're the big blue chip companies, um, you know, so, yeah. Um, and just, I'm aware of time, so I'll just wrap it up with, uh, with one more question. And I know it's something that has, has come into the, comes to the fore bit recently, only because I've been working with a few people who work in um, fintech. Um, is, is the current situation making people more susceptible to fraud, fraudsters? Yes, most definitely. We've done, I've done a couple of emails out to most of my clients um, over this, uh, this, uh, this, this lockdown period and they th fraudsters absolutely thrive on this kind of conditions. They really do. Um, the common ones are invoice fraud. Um, everybody's working from home, send a couple of invoices out to larger companies. They get, get automatically get paid. Nobody checks on them. And, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're totally bogus. C um, C CEO fraud, quite a good one, um, came in about 15 years ago and it's, it's just increased and increased and increased, but it's where the boss phones up his PA and asks her to send a load of money through to a different bank account instead of the normal one, or sends an email or does something with the accounts department, happening all the time, all, all the time, and we've had quite a few um, instances for that. Um, investment fraud, 
very nice, uh, very good one at the moment, uh, whereby these people have been monitoring your emails for, year, for months and months and months or years and years and years. And then all of a sudden they make a change to what you're doing. Um, and it's so well done. It really is. And unless you're vigilant, um, you know, you are going to get sucked in. The only thing I can say to you is if anybody tells you they can get you 12 percent uh, next week uh, over a five year period, blah, blah, blah. It's probably wrong. Um, so you've okay. just got to validate it and validate it with either your mate or your financial advisor or your mum and dad or whatever. Just ask the, uh, the relevant people. Okay. Look, Kev, we'll have to leave it there, but really appreciate yeah. that. And, and especially those tips on, on the fraudsters and things to look out for because it's so, so prominent and they are getting cleverer and cleverer. So yeah. true. Uh, really appreciate it, Kevin. Thank you very much. We'll fire sure. some extra questions to you later on as well, but I want to move on and introduce our special guest this afternoon, someone who's been number one in the world at a sport, lifted medals at Olympic Games and Commonwealth Games, now enjoys a, a life talking about performance and success, but still continues to support Spurs. KLMs. All right, okay. So um, th there's a little bit of uh, confliction there, obviously. Um, but yeah, you know, my heart is Spurs, what can I say? It's, um, it's my mum's fault. Um, it's, either <laughs> that or Nor it's either that or Norwich City, so yeah. Okay. All right. It's fine, yeah. it's all right. We all have our cross to bear. We all have our cross to bear. <laughs> okay. um, so, so, so how has how's, how's lockdown treated you? How have you, have you filled the time, killed the time, nailed the time? What's it been like? Oh, it has been um, an emotional roller coaster, I would say. I think when you work in sport and you work in events and then COVID happened and lockdown happened and you see everything and April to July is usually my busiest time of the year and I earn the bulk of my money in that time and that sets me through the rest of, of the year. I go to lots of schools, I do lots of school sports awards and all that and then to, to when you've worked for so hard to get these bookings in the diary and then you're just crossing everything out, it's like being punched in the stomach, it's being it's been, I've cried, I've, I've been on the sofa for a couple of days saying, you know, I can't do this anymore, you know. Then I'm suddenly filled with motivation, I'm going to take over the world, but I don't quite know what to do. It has been knackering, actually. It's been knackering, to, like juggling with my emotions. Um, I'm, I'm better now because I've had, actually, not done so much uh, opportunities have arisen, but it has been tough. Um, tough mentally emotionally financially and yeah and, and many people are the same so some people are going to have you know come out of this and just be like you know in a better place some people are going to be in a worse place but this is what we're going to have to work with not only in a business sense but in like a personal sense how are we going to get businesses back and running when you've got people who have been really affected in very very different ways very different ends of scale some are going to be filled with motivation other than not. So we've got lots of different dynamics um, that are going to happen, but I, I really have been through all of them, <laughs> that's for sure. But I've been filling my time, I've been exercising, I've been doing what I can, basically. I hate being, I, I'm not a sit down on a sofa and watch Netflix girl, so. Did, did you find, have you found keeping fit easy? Because a lot of people have had to adjust from whatever they're, you know, if they were fitness freaks, if they were in the gym all the time, you couldn't do yeah. that for a while, so you had to adapt and do things at home. How did you adapt like that? If I, if I see Joe Wicks again, I think I might punch him. That is definitely for sure. I've got two boys and then 10 and seven. And you know what? It was great for about four days. And then afterwards, I was like, oh my gosh, if I do high knees one more time, I'm going to get literally. Um, you know, it's, it is hard. And I, I love variation. I, I love boxing. I love circuit training. I get my energy from other people. So, you know, much as I've been going out running, it has been hard work to go out there on my own. Um, but you know what, you've, you've just got to look at the long, why are you doing it? You know, what's the emotional connection? Why are you doing it? And it, with lockdown, a lot of people are doing it for their mental health as well as their physical health. And actually that is why so many people have stuck at it and are really enjoying that outdoors and that outdoor exercise. Uh, for me, it was exactly the same. I'm, I get quite claustrophobic in the house. So get outside, get that mental health, you know, that fresh air going. So, so, so take us back then, because I know badminton is something you got into at quite an early age, but mm -hmm. how did it come to be that as a sport, 
you know, it was your calling. It was, it was, it was for you. It was what you were going up doing and, and, and doing yeah. pretty well at, you know. I wish it had been a sport with a lot more money, to be fair. And I wish it'd be a, it was a sport that was a little bit more popular, more glamorous, rather than a sport that the whole of China play and that all my life I've been playing in the Far East. <laughs> you know, of all the glamour places there are in the world, I, I, I didn't go. I was in the middle of Korea and some, you know, crazy island of, of Indonesia. That's where I was. And it, it is strange because it is a minority sport and it is one of these, you know, sports that maybe play in the back garden or something like that. But for me, um, I'm from Bedford and there's a tin hut that was around the corner from my house. Uh, I have my parents to blame for it. My mum and dad were members of the club, but my mum, interestingly enough, was actually a footballer. So my mum's the world, uh, she was one of the first lionesses. So she played women's football for England. But she, so instead of teaching me football, she said, well, there was no, nowhere for me to play football. There were no girls teams. There was nothing like that for me to go. So she was like, well, there's no point. I don't want you to go through all the abuse that I went through. So let's go and play badminton. Let's go and be part of something else. And to be honest, I did all sport. I could have pretty much chosen any sport. It's just that badminton was the one. If any of you have read Matthew Said's book, Bounce, uh, he talks about a table tennis uh, place at the end of his road. And it is about that. It's about opening doors for kids. If there is a place where people can go, kids can go, feel safe, feel happy, they will play, they will get better. Exactly the same for me. And then, you know, before you know, 1995, I think it was, it was the first time you represented England. Yeah. And you go on to win Commonwealth Games medals, uh, Olympic medals. So looking back over, uh, over those now, which, which, which means the most to you, you think? Um, I've actually got it here. It's definitely the Olympic one. Um, I mean, there were many titles along the way, obviously. Beating my mum for a start, age, age 12, that was the biggest title. That set me off. I think I if I'd have continuously lost to her, that would have been it. It was all over. But this one, I don't know if you can see it. There it is. It's a little bit worn out now. Um, but this really was, this is my first ever final in a world stage. And I was 27 years old. And a lot of people would have given up by then. But for me, the reason why is, that's why it's so special, because I could have given up. And when I stood on this podium in 2004 Athens, I wasn't happy. I wanted gold. And that spurred me on to all the other titles. So that is why this one is my favourite, because of what it did. You know, it's, there was no, I didn't want to, oh, I've won a medal, that's it, I'm going to give up now. It was... I've won a medal, it's only silver, I want gold. I was just in that, that, that winning that silver medal actually spurred on all of that when you think, you know, getting to an Olympic final, especially, would be obviously so important. Does it, does it always live down there, by the way, for every Zoom call, or where is it normally in the house? Uh, it, it is in, oh God, the secrets of where I keep my medal. Right, see this little glamour travel pouch. I think it's like a... Um, you know, you get on, a, on an air flight, an airplane or whatever. On the long flights, on the long, on the long flights. Long flights yeah. I probably got, I thought, yeah. that's, that's quite good to keep my medals in. Um, <laughs> I do take it quite, because I, I, I go to local schools and I actually like the kids wearing it because I think it's important for them to feel it. Instead of just seeing it on TV or me talking about it, when you see some of the kids, when they wear that medal, they just go, oh, oh my God. And that, that's why you win the medals, because you can have those moments for other people and that, that makes it all worth it. And what about when you, when you did finally finish? Mm. What, what, was that, what was that transition like from it? From, I'm guessing, you know, when, when you're playing at the level you are, it, 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 it's, it's your life, it dominates your life. It's everything, you throw everything into, you make sacrifices for it, all sorts of stuff like that. And then all of a sudden you're in this life where that's, that's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's a big thing that sports people talk about now, especially ones that have been so successful like you. It's that, what happens now? What, how do you find something else to do with yourself? Yeah, and there's, there's so many ways of looking at this. And, and I hold my hands up and I, I could have prepared better. You know, I've got to take full responsibility that it's my, my life. But however, there was no help. There was no... Um, encouragement from other people to prepare myself for later in life so I was like well they're not worried so I'm not going to be worried and a sports person is all about ego 
and we, we, this is how we get up. We're like, yeah, yeah, we're the best. We're the best. And you got all the coaches saying, you're the best, you're the best. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm the best. I'm the best. And you live in this world and you live in this bubble that you are the best and everyone loves you. Then when you come out of the bubble and then you realize that it's a bubble and suddenly that no one gives a, <laughs> no one gives one that you're the best <laughs> at badminton. And then it's like that bubble just goes boop, and you're on this cliff and you're like, oh boom and you just crash and it's that ego deflation it's that sense of purpose sense of identity all those things and, and lots of people go through that as well if they're going through transition or retirement or in business if they're changing careers or going self self-employed or whatever you do go through that because you do not even know who you are you don't actually know what you're going to do and you think that people are going to come running because I'm amazing and then when they don't you're like huh, 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 huh. and then you're like stuck and it's it is scary scary world so yeah it was <laughs> it wasn't fun that's for sure so so what was it what was what was the thing that what, what was the moment that you suddenly found you know, found your next purpose what do you what do you think it was I think it was working in school. So I got a job um, with the Youth Sport Trust. I mean, it was only a part-time job, but they were like, can you go into schools and talk about your sports journey? And I was like, that's okay. I can talk about the wins and, you know, I'm amazing. I'm Gail Ems. And they were like, no, you'll be talking to kids that don't like sport. And you'll be talking to kids that have had real trouble backgrounds. And it was like a real, whoa, uh, again, I'd led quite a, a sheltered life, you know, sport, everything worked out, won medals, you know, it is quite sheltered. I haven't really seen the world, I've traveled, but not, not really known what was going on. And when you work with kids and you see another side and what sport can do for people, and, and actually I started breaking down my journey, like a, a bit like what we're doing now. And I was like, ah, this is why I did this. So it's all that reflective t journey, talking about it. I actually went, I could do this. I can help people. I can use the lessons that I learn in sport and I can help kids, CEOs, 18-year-olds, uh, you know, whoever, it doesn't matter. Because the message is, it's, you can relate that and people can use that to help them whatever they achieve, just like sport helped me. Okay, so let's talk about things now that you fill your time with you can't uh look at any of your, your socials at the minute without seeing you out on the golf course yeah how's the, how's the golf how's the golf going now what's the what's the mission with that <laughs> what's the issue with my golf uh the mission of, the mission not the issue, issue the mission um golf and i have had a lot a love hate relationship for a long time um i first started playing 11 years ago when i first retired and being the cocky sports person, I thought I'd be a, a you know expert at it straight away. Uh, obviously, wasn't. And then I had children, so that that really screws up your goals. <laughs> God. Um, and then uh, last couple of years, I do a lot of the golf days, and you know, sort of go and I'm with all the ex sports people. And I'm, I, you know, I'm a girl in sport who's used to playing against the guys. So I'm giving all this, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll beat you, I'll beat you. And then my golf is like more happy Gilmore than Ian Poulter. So, you know, it's it's more the entertainment side and I'm going to actually kill someone or potential wildlife problems <laughs> than <laughs> actually scoring points for the team, which I'm supposed to do. So, um, yeah, I've made it my quest. Um, I've, I've de I'm determined. There is a golfer inside of me. It really is. It's, <laughs> it may be, it's like really there. And so I'm doing this quest to, to actually I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a golfer. That's it. Well, I've, I've seen a few of the people who are, who are joining us this afternoon on a, on a couple of the Amros golf days. And I think probably secretly they'd say they're about the same level as you from what it yeah. sounds like. So a, coll a collection of us all out together could be quite a show for a golf course somewhere in the yeah. near future. We probably need um, insurance as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll sort that. That's fine. We have, we have plenty of people, plenty of people in the call who would be sticking their hands up on them. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, look, so, guys, if you want to pop any other questions in, we've got a couple of minutes left. We've had a couple through already, but you can just stick them on the chat if you've got anything. I'm going to pop a quick one to you first, uh, Gail. 
Uh, Ian Richards from IDR Consultants says, who's your favourite adversary on Fighting Talk? Now, for anyone who doesn't know, Ooh. Fighting Talk's a, a show on uh, Five Live, uh, normally Saturday mornings, and it's um, basically points to punditry, but the idea is to be as scathing or as knowledgeable or as both or as little as, as possible, really, isn't it? Who, who do you enjoy taking on the most on that? Oh, do you know what? There's some great guests on Fighting Talk, and I love... Do you know what? I've not had... There was one person who remained nameless, but he was a bit funny and I didn't really like him. Um, but the one person who I genuinely love with all my heart, but oh my God, he roasts me. Like he literally brings me down in about two seconds. And that's Justin Morehouse. Brilliant, brilliant comic. Um, and literally I'll start saying something. He's like that straight away. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, he is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, definitely one of my favourite. Uh, and to be fair, he's so clever at how he does it. I don't, I don't mind being completely, yeah, completely taken down by him. Uh, Neil from Amros, the boss. So you have to answer <laughs> this, unfortunately, no matter what. But it should be fairly easy. I know we talked about golf and you talked about your mum playing football. Is there any other sports you're now throwing yourself into or is it, is it all the golf? Yes, there's one more that I've decided to take on the world at, and that's paddle tennis. So I don't know if you know paddle tennis. It is a cross between no. tennis and squash. It's the fastest growing sport in the world. And it's on the third of a tennis court, and you've got like the, a cage, so it can go off the walls. And it's what's perfect for me is because in tennis, they've got topspin, and I'm a balance pair, and I don't do the topspin. So you can combine it. It's like bat and ball, you know what you buy on the, on the beach. But it's a thicker yeah. bat with a tennis ball and it is so much fun really really good so it's a few it's it is growing in this country and i got asked last year to play in the gb over 35 team or something like that so yeah that is my that's another sport um stoke park i've just got a couple of um courts open there are some courts in the west midlands as well actually so um if you haven't tried it you'll see it everywhere in spain and portugal there's paddle courts mm. everywhere but we're not quite as many in this country as i'd like okay nice noted that's all right can you socially distance with it do you need to socially yeah. distance with it we played in stoke park it was actually because it's like a uh, tennis court so we were allowed to play last week yeah. so uh, if stoke park says yes I'm sorry. i i i was fine yeah. yeah good good um and the last question uh it's a bit deep Oh. Brace yourself. It's from Harmy Baines, who's asking about any regrets from life, any decisions or anything you, you look back on. You might not at all, but was there any particular decisions or incidents you think back of and maybe wish you'd done anything different? I, you know, if, uh, we could go back and it, there's lots of regrets. Um, and, you know, if when you hear my journey that, you know, I could have done things differently, of course, we can. And I've already admitted about my transition, for instance, about being more sort of being less stubborn listening better getting more prepared and everything like that for later life biggest regret i think in a very general point i wish i'd realized how incredibly strong i was as a person physically and mentally i wish i'd realized that earlier in my life um i think for women we hold back a little bit um, and I'm generalizing a lot. So obviously, you know, it's a, it's a very girl thing, not to be, not to be too, I can do this and, and to be too, um, uh, to go outside that comfort zone. It seemed very, it's very masculine to do that. I wish I'd done that earlier because when I did do that, oh my God, you know, the, the my, my improvement went through the roof. Um, I held back a bit and I wish I, I wish I'd have realized how strong I was. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, perfect, perfect. Um, Gareth, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We do appreciate it. And it's obvious that how much, you know, how passionate you are about success and everything. So obviously the fact that you're doing that as part of what you are now is, is great. I'm going to ask one more favour of you because I'm going to introduce Neil in a sec. And N Neil will try to um, make a joke. Okay. It's, it's going to happen. <laughs> So I, I wonder if you fancied sitting on the on the drum kit and you might be able to give him a, a doom chi if he drops one. Right, okay. <laughs> he might not, or he might do one and it's not funny. I but can do a drum roll, I think. 
Okay, yeah, maybe a drum roll's better just in case. I don't know how loud it's going to be. There we go. All right, there we are. Look at that. Right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's introduce your Amros director, who this week said he built a paddling pool to specifically address you from today. Let's see if he's done it. Neil, over to you. Put yourself back on the gallery view, by the way. Neil. Well, um, thank you, Hursty. Uh, you you really put me on the spot again, haven't you, you bugger? But uh, listen, it's what it's about, but uh, all, all good fun. Um, yes, uh, I have put a paddling pool. Uh, three metres, that's about the length I can swim, but it, it's purely for one of my dogs who's poorly, we broke his leg to re rehabilitate him. Uh, but, um, but it's a nice to have a plunge there every evening uh, with a drink in there ha in my hand, so which is quite nice. But um, thanks, Ersty. The jokes are down the bottom, Emma, uh, Gail, so uh, you're all right for a while. Um, anyway, first of all, thank you all for staying connected today. Um, I hope uh, it's been uh, educational uh, with Kevin and help people along uh, with finances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, we had uh, Gail earlier in the year at one of our Black Country lunches, and I think you will say she's thoroughly entertaining. Um, besides entertaining, there's some thought in there. Um, uh, and I really you know, felt that what you put together in the Black Country and today will inspire not only ladies, but girls, boys, and whatever. And uh, I think it's great. And uh, some of these little video clips that I've seen of Gail going golfing, uh, yes, um, I, I, I think went worth with the expletives that were kept coming out. Uh, there was more bleeps than anything that was coming out. But listen, it's what it's all about. It, it, it's the game. And, uh, you know, and I do believe, you know, doing all these things uh, keeps the mind and body active. Uh, so absolutely fantastic. Um, the draw uh, for the bottle of wine today. Ian, I can see you. Ian Richards, IDR. Well, it, the bottle is coming to you. Uh, I'll be sending you an email afterwards uh, to find out what you require and where you want it sent in. Uh, I think Andrea got rid of her bottle last week, I think within a day. Uh, it, it wasn't around for long, was it, Andrea? No, definitely not. Uh, but and that's great. Um, must thank Hursty uh, again for putting me on the spot. Um, but your hosting today and the experience that you had two weeks ago when uh, our sponsor had lots of IT uh, issues, I think you, you, you actually shone and uh, dealt with it very, very good. Uh, but of course, this would happen without uh, Jack uh, Courtry, who's doing all the production of this. Jack, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it really does, uh, it's a team effort of putting it all together. Uh, not only this, the early part of next week where Hursty has put together our first podcast, uh, which is highlighting the first four uh, of our virtual lunches. And I must say, it is fantastic, entertaining, uh, but it shows what it's all about. Um, so, uh, Ursi's has done a great job for us. And by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll put a, a plug in here for Hursty is that uh, if you, your company, want some podcasts doing on the basis of what he's done for me already, is the main man. So uh, I, he'll do a good job there. So it's there. Um, also, I'm Ross and plug-in, uh, we can do virtual actual events. And I, I, I think we're, we're going to get back to some sort of actual events. Today, I've got the nod from a golf course. 
that we can get and put together a golf course with a barbecue afterwards. So Gail, we'll we'll get you on there. So and and I'm looking at quite a lot of golfers uh, on the screen here. Uh, Craig, I'm not including you. You put your thumb up, but I'm not including you as a golfer, mate. But no, it's good. Uh, so uh, so things are progressing. But before we, you know, we've got a few more of these virtual lunches uh, until we completely get out of lockdown and back to normal. But besides this, I mentioned two weeks ago, uh, we've put together a virtual uh, wine and cheese tasting event. Uh, but it's a quiz, ch challenge, whatever. Uh, it's all based on the old TV program called My Bluff. And uh, with that uh, program, we need a celebrity uh, panel. Uh, we've got our stalwart, uh, a local television uh, newsreader of many and many a year, uh, Mr. Bob Warman, who's also heading up the panel because he's actually done it before. Uh, he remembers starting these uh, events, but he's never remembered finishing one because he's never been in a good enough uh, condition to do so. Uh, but Gail has agreed to also come on the panel, and I can see she's had a bottle of Moretti, I think it was, in her hand most of the day. Is it Moretti? Yes, it is. Uh, um, so I, I think by the time you've had four bottles of wine, I think you, it, it, it's going to be a, 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 good, a, a good evening. Uh, I mean, the, the, these events are open not just for one person, the household, or your bubble uh, you know, can get involved, uh, which, it, which will be great. Uh, we're just waiting to finalise the rest of the panel. Uh, but it's definitely an event that uh, cannot be missed, or you'd be silly to do so. It's only going to be have a small charge but it includes your four bottles of wine, pork pie, cheeses, uh, and entertainment. But most importantly, it's raising some funds for Wooden Spoon Worcestershire. Um, so local children's charity uh, and keeps within Worcester. So it's great. Um, that's me done. Um, next Stay uh, Connected is in two weeks' time, sponsored by... Crow UK. So that's all from me, except to say, stay safe. Cheers to you all and have a great weekend. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. See you all. Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone. See you soon.